Welcome in to Outkick the Show. I'm your fearless leader, Clay Travis. I hope all of you are having fantastic Tuesdays. Had to think there for a sec. What day of the week is it? Fantastic Tuesdays, no matter where you may be across this great country or this great land. Uh, We got a lot to talk about. This is going to be a show that I say make sure you clip this one because I'm fired up about a ton. Uh, but right off the top, Prize Picks, America's number one daily fantasy sports app with Prize Picks. You against the number. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn 10 bucks into $1,000. And once the NFL gets underway, they're giving you a guaranteed winner each week. Caleb Williams passes for at least one yard. Boom. You win starting next week when the NFL kicks off. For the first several weeks of the season, you get a guaranteed win. We'll be taking that guaranteed win next week. Although, to be fair, we didn't need it. We won on our prize picks pick last week. Uh, DJ Ugalalele went under uh, on uh, uh, under the uh, the number with less on the uh, passing yards. And our guy Stone, uh, I believe is his last name, uh, in uh, at SMU went over. And as a result, we had a double win. Uh, and all of you cashed a winner if you were on prize picks. Prize picks, best way to win real money this football season. Which players are going off? Which ones aren't? Make your picks fast. Doesn't take very much time at all. You got it right on the app. And you can get hooked up in a hurry. Get hooked up right now. Go to the Prize Picks app, and you get a first deposit match up to $100. That is, you put in $100, they will double it, give you another $100. I'll give you a pick on Thursday. Prize Picks, run your game. Okay, speaking of running a game, uh, unfortunately, the FBI, maybe the CIA, certainly the deep state has been running a game on all of us. Blockbuster revelations yesterday uh, via Mark Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg came out and said something that he had previously discussed on the Joe Rogan podcast, but I hadn't seen written out in plain English before. In a letter addressed to James jo- Jim Jordan, who we're going to have on the Clay and Buck program tomorrow to talk about this in great detail, uh, Mark Zuckerberg made three major statements. One, and I'm going to unpack each of these. One, he said that the FBI had told, I'm going to read his words exactly, but basically the FBI had told him to be aware of Russian disinfo as it pertained to a Hunter Biden laptop, Burisma, the allegations there. I'm going to dive into that. Two, he said that the Biden administration was regularly demanding that they censor posts on Facebook uh, and that many of those uh, requests he thought were too expansive. Three, he said he's not going to donate money to be involved in the election in 2024. There are going to be no so-called Zuckerbucks uh, available out there in the larger marketplace. So I'm going to talk about the first two, and I want to talk in particular about the first one. I'm going to read to you, all of you, directly from the actual Mark Zuckerberg letter. So these are going to be Zuckerberg's words, not my own. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, in his letter to Jim Jordan, again, Jim Jordan going to be on with us on Clay and Buck tomorrow, uh, Mark Zuckerberg said as follows, uh, and I'm reading, I'm focusing first on the 2020 Hunter uh, Biden laptop story, Um, and I think it's the most significant. This is a direct quote. The FBI warned us about a potential Russian disinformation operation about the Biden family and Burisma in the lead up to the 2020 election. That fall, when we saw a New York Post story reporting on corruption allegations involving then-Democrat presidential nominee Joe Biden's family, we sent that story to fact-checkers for review and temporarily demoted it while waiting for a reply. It's since been made clear the reporting was not Russian disinformation, and in retrospect, we shouldn't have demoted the story. We've changed our policies and processes to make sure this doesn't happen again. For instance, we no longer temporarily demote things in the U.S. while waiting for fact checkers. Okay, this is Mark Zuckerberg in a letter um, to Jim Jordan came out yesterday afternoon. I'm going to focus on that paragraph that I just read. Again, Mark Zuckerberg's own words in a letter uh, on behalf of Facebook Meta that he sent to Jim Jordan. This is really vitally important. And I I don't think I really ever ask for this, 
But I would ask for those of you watching this to make sure that you share this clip because I'm sure that we're going to clip this and there'll be a shorter version. But I think this is important for lots of people to see. This factually is not very complicated. In December of 2019, the FBI seized Hunter Biden's laptop from a Delaware computer repairman, John Paul MacIsaac. That laptop was 100% real. Everything that the New York Post wrote about, everything that has been out there in public, the FBI knew by the time we got to 2020, they knew that Hunter Biden's laptop was 100% accurate, that the evidence of Hunter Biden taking tens of millions of dollars in payments from foreign interest, that Joe Biden's own involvement based on emails in the 10% for the big guy, all of it was 100% accurate. Okay? We know that. It's been entered as evidence. It's led to felony convictions now in Delaware and will probably lead to felony convictions in California. Even left-wing jurors have looked at this. Hunter Biden did not contest the accuracy of the laptop when it was introduced as evidence. But this is very, very important. The FBI knew the laptop was real. There's a lot of focus on Facebook. There's a lot of focus on Twitter, other social media companies for censoring this story. There's not enough on this question. Who intentionally lied to protect Joe Biden by telling Facebook in the summer of 2020 when they knew this laptop was real that a story like this would be coming and that it was Russian disinformation? Who ordered the code red in our government. They knew the Hunter Biden laptop was real, and they went to Facebook and they went to Twitter, your FBI, and told all of these social media employees, beware, this is coming, and it's fake. Now, I want you to pause for a sec. That happened the data reflects that if this story had been accurately covered, it would have changed the mind of enough voters that standing alone, this story would have gotten Trump reelected. Think about what's happened since then. Does Russia invade Ukraine? Does Hamas attack Israel? Does inflation go from 1.4% to over 9%? Do many kids stay out of school for another year? Plus, is there a COVID shot mandate? Think about all the things. Does the border open up and 10 million plus illegals stream across? Think about all the impact based on that rig job for who was in the office of the presidency. Okay? So I want to start with this. It's easy to blame Zuckerberg. It's easy to blame Jack Dorsey, who was then in control of Twitter. But I want all of you to pause for a moment, and I want you to pretend that the FBI knocked on your door and set you down and told you something that was 100% a lie that they knew was coming because they were tracking all of the different media apparatus because they were following John Paul MacIsaac because they knew the New York Post was sniffing around this story because they knew United States senators go listen to Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson called into the show, hearing me talk about this earlier in the program. All of this happens. Do we really blame the tech companies for believing that the FBI was telling the truth to them? Wouldn't most of us, pre-understanding the rig job, have thought, oh, the FBI wouldn't 100% make this up. And when they saw that New York Post story, the natural reaction was, holy crap, the FBI was right. Russia's trying to influence our election. I actually don't blame Zuckerberg. I don't blame Dorsey. This was a natural reaction most people would have had if you ran a media company like this and you got this style of briefing. 
But here's the deal. The tech companies aren't the story. Zuckerberg's apologizing for his reaction to it. The story is no one inside of our intelligence agencies has been held accountable for the lies that they spread about the Hunter Biden laptop when they knew it was real. They had it since December of 2019. They've introduced it as evidence in a court of law and it hasn't been contested. Everything the New York Post reported was accurate. This is way bigger than Watergate. This is the biggest story of corruption in the 21st century in my entire life and nobody was held accountable. In fact, the 51 intelligence agents who lied and said this had all the hallmarks of Russian disinformation, all of those people, no consequences either. In fact, many of them got promotions. Many of them actually got high-level jobs in the Biden administration. How deep does this lie go? Everybody wants to talk about misinformation and disinformation the American people via our own intelligence agencies were lied to about this at a level that has never occurred in any presidential election before. And far from somebody being held accountable, many people got promoted for it. We still don't know who ordered the code red. This is the biggest story. Okay. And let me pause here for a moment. I try to stand on principle and talk about stories in a significant way that are honest, whether you're a Republican, Democrat, or an independent. I want you to think about for a moment, how would the New York Times, how would the Washington Post, CBS, NBC, ABC, CNN, MSNBC, seven media outlets that by and large have huge audiences and are for the most part not covering this Mark Zuckerberg letter at all. How would they cover the same letter if Mark Zuckerberg was writing the exact same letter, but instead of the Biden administration trying to censor their political opponents on Facebook, and instead of the FBI, the CIA, whatever intelligence apparatus was spreading the lie about the Hunter Biden laptop that they knew was real, imagine that that laptop had instead shown corruption from the Trump family payments of tens of millions of dollars for illicit lobbying of foreign governments with major interest in front of our own United States. New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, NBC, all seven of those outlets would be covering this story as it should be covered as the biggest story in modern American political history. Instead, almost all of them are ignoring it. If you question where bias in media is, it's not only in what stories are covered, it's in what stories are ignored. And I would submit to you, we can't have an honest election when the media is this dishonest. And to me, and, and I understand some of you, people are going to share this and be like, oh, Clay Travis has gone crazy. He's like the guy standing in front of the, you know, the meme screen where he's like, and then this connects to this. And then, no, no, hold on. If our government will lie to us about a laptop that was in their possession that they knew was real because they wanted to protect the Biden family, how can you trust them in the 2024 election? How can you trust them with anything? This goes deep. And... The reason why I'm asking you to share this clip or this whole show if you want, but certainly the clip that we're going to share is there are hundreds of millions of Americans who still have no idea this is true. They're not going to see the Mark Zuckerberg letter. They think that whatever they see on their Facebook feed is 100% honest and not distorted reality. We've got to get into the quote unquote middle of the road normal population. And I know a lot of you are watching me right now, and you have followed me. RFK Jr., Tulsi Gabbard, me, all three of us have voted Democrat for much of our lives until we suddenly saw the deep rabbit hole of lies that has sprung up surrounding COVID 
and has sprung up surrounding the Trump administration. I don't see this as a Republican, Democrat, or independent issue. I see it as an American issue. And the fact that many of our media won't even cover it is a massively significant story. Now, the second part of Zuckerberg's letter is also a huge story. The fact that the Biden administration was demanding that Facebook censor posts that they did not like on the website. This is a clear First Amendment violation. The general rule is the government can't have someone else do what it itself would not be allowed to do. That is, for purposes of the First Amendment, it restricts government suppression of speech. That means that the Biden administration couldn't log on to Facebook servers and delete comments that they didn't like that citizens were posting on Facebook. That would be a clear First Amendment violation because it's a direct act undertaken by the federal government to uh, influence, by the way, the entire course of our nation. It would not be allowed. But the government also can't deputize an entity to do what it would otherwise be unable to do. Threatening Facebook and demanding that they pull down posts should be a First Amendment violation, in my opinion, if you believe in an expansive protection of the First Amendment. Facebook's entitled to have whatever moderation policies it finds necessary as a private company, but that private company shouldn't be acting at the behest of the government to do what the government cannot. This is a fundamental rule, because think about it. If the government can merely have another group do what it cannot do, then our Bill of Rights has no uh, functional reality at all. In other words, take it outside of the First Amendment. If the government said, hey, uh, you can no longer have the right to have guns. But they didn't say it themselves. Instead, they used your tax dollars to hire a entity that was responsible for going door to door and taking your guns. The government can't deputize others to take away rights. That's exactly what's been going on here based on what happened with Mark Zuckerberg. This is a big deal, okay? Because, and and this is significant, and this is what a traditional liberal used to believe. It used to be the case that left-wingers understood the power of the First Amendment because it allowed minority opinions to be heard in a majority context. Let me explain. In 1980, if you argued gay people should be married, you would have largely been laughed off the stage of any political speech. That was a very strongly minority position, such that all the way back in 2012 and 2008, Barack Obama, patron saint of the left now, ran on the idea that gay marriage should not be permitted. Okay. Now, by 2016, the idea that you could believe that gay marriage shouldn't be legal was such that you basically didn't even hardly feel like you could say it publicly. The marketplace of ideas protects minority interest because it allows a minority opinion to take root and later become a majority opinion. I use gay marriage as an example because it's theoretically something that came from the left. The free speech that is usually curtailed the most is of a minority because a majority restricts what you're able to say. This is hugely important. I used to vote Democrat because my foundational belief is in the marketplace of ideas. In fact, in this book... I went back, somebody sent me this a while ago, the very first thing I ever had published under my name was a First Amendment defense when I was an undergraduate student at George Washington University. It's still up online, you can go read it in the GW Hatchet, published in the fall of 1997 when I was 18 years old and a dyed-in-the-wool Democrat voter. I was defending one of our uh, administrators who was being attacked for using the phrase rule of thumb 
which a woman at the university who was also a student believed was unacceptable because of the history of the phrase rule of thumb, which she said dealt with uh, how wide a stick a man could use to beat his wife with, and therefore the idea that a uh, administrator at George Washington University would use the phrase rule of thumb was completely unacceptable. 1997, I ridiculed her for that opinion and said, in fact, well, I'll read it at some point, but it's in the book. You can search it out. Type in Clay Travis, GW Hatchet. I wrote a couple of sports articles. The very first thing under my name that has ever been published, 1997, letter to the editor, making fun of the idea that we should be restricting speech because a phrase like rule of thumb was unacceptable. In 1997, that was considered to be a left-wing opinion. 2024, suddenly defending the First Amendment is a right-wing political perspective. One reason that I'm uncomfortable with labels is because I don't know what in 20 years the world's going to look like. Maybe the world keeps spinning and Democrats end up rejecting cancel culture and, and Republicans want to embrace it and we've switched sides on which party protects the First Amendment more. What I've done is stay consistently principled on the things that I care about. Number one thing I care about is the First Amendment. Because if you don't have full, flourished marketplace of ideas, First Amendment rights, then we do not have an actual marketplace of ideas. And whatever solutions and resolutions we reach as a country are broken. So the Zuckerberg letter is a huge freaking deal. It should be on the front page of every newspaper. It should be the lead story on every broadcast. The fact that it is not is evidence of how broken our media discourse is. As is, by the way, the fact that so many media outlets right now are in favor of censorship. I've been making this argument for a long time. No one who wants to ban an idea or a book from consumption by adults is ever on the right side of history. Now, we can talk about particular age range. People say, oh, well, you know, you don't think that some book about trans ideology should be in a second grader's library. Yeah, that's true. There is age appropriate restriction, but no one who is 18 or older should have in any way their right to share an opinion curtailed, even if I disagree with it completely. This is about why the Zuckerberg letter is so incredibly important. But again, coming back to this, December of 2019, the FBI knew the laptop was real. They had it in their possession. They had ID'd it through the Apple IDs, everything else. And yet, they continued to argue that next year, to help Joe Biden get elected, that it was actually fake. The opposite of what they knew to be true. Most successful disinformation, misinformation campaign in the history of my life as an American citizen as it pertains to the election itself. Okay. Um, and we'll have Jim Jordan on to talk about it tomorrow. I talked about it a great deal. If you're really intrigued by this, go listen to Clay and Buck. Listen to what Ron Johnson, senator from Wisconsin, said about all this. Again, it's the biggest political story in our lives, and a lot of people are not covering it. Um, I think this is crazy. One of the best assets you can have, I think, is to see across disciplines. That is, I love sports. I'm going to talk with you about the most overrated teams in a college football era. It'll get clipped. Everybody will love it. It's not really that significant. It's fun, but it's not that significant. But there are sometimes sports-related stories that cross into politics or vice versa that are significant. And I thought about this morning, that issue. Um, for those of you who don't know my history, I started doing spoken word out of written word. I started as a writer. The very first weekly radio bit that I've ever had is with my buddy Lance Taylor down in Birmingham. He was on a station called Jocks, where Paul Feinbaum was on. They were the midday show leading into Paul Feinbaum. Um, and I started going on with Lance like back in like 2006. Never been paid. Now he does a show uh, with uh, Jim Dunaway and Ryan Brown. Uh, they have a great show. Uh, and I've been, I've been on with LT for nearly 20 years now, weekly. 
gone on as a guest. A lot of you in Birmingham area listening to me right now, it's probably the first time you ever heard my voice. Now, by the way, we've got the number one radio show in Birmingham. It's Clay and Buck show. Not even a sports show, at least not when it's football season. We do really well down there. Appreciate all of you. Reason why I bring that up. I would go on and talk about my written articles, and that's how I found out I wasn't bad in, uh, in radio. And then eventually um, I started doing local sports talk radio, uh, middays, and then prime time, uh, in the drive time in the evenings. And then I started doing a national sports talk radio show. That's how I ended up looking at you right now, founding out, kick, all those things. Okay. Reason why I bring all that up is I think that it's important to think cross discipline. A lot of people focus really exclusively on one particular issue. This morning I was on with LT and Dunaway and Brown, and LT asked me about the Dion controversy, which has to do with the fact that Dion doesn't want to interact with a reporter that basically he believes has been too critical of his program. And it's turned into a huge controversy that Dion would not be willing to talk to this reporter. And when they asked me about it, I couldn't help but make the immediate connection and think, boy, this is really funny, isn't it? The sports media is angrier at Deion Sanders for not talking to a particular member of the sports media than the national political media is at Kamala Harris for not doing a single press conference or interview since she became the nominee for president of the United States. And it got me thinking even more, we have higher standards of media interaction requirement for football coaches, both college and pro, than we do for Kamala Harris, who's running for president of the United States. So I want you to just think about this for a minute with me. Every college football coach and NFL coach in America has at least two press conferences every week, at least two. Some have more. A lot of times the coach will leave practice and talk and take questions from everybody who's covering the team in addition to the normal press conferences. But after every game, there is a press conference. Head coach sits there, takes questions from anybody. After, in the middle of a game week, virtually every coach has a press conference. What does it say that head coaches in college and the NFL are required to answer questions and interact with the media and explain themselves more than Kamala Harris, who is the Democrat contender to be president of the United States. What's more important, that Deion Sanders be grilled by some random dude covering his team in Denver, or that the would-be president of the United States actually have to answer questions? And what does it say about our current media environment that Deion Sanders is being criticized more heavily by sports media for not taking questions from every single media member than Kamala Harris is for not taking a single question in a press conference or doing an interview with any media outlet for over a month? How is it that we expect more media access from our football coaches than we do our presidential candidate. That's pretty wild. And I wouldn't have thought about it, I don't think, if I didn't have the, the background that I do in sports and in politics now. We hold Deion Sanders to a higher standard of media access and behavior in Colorado than we do Kamala Harris, and she's running for president of the United States. I'd love to hear somebody refute that. I think it is a fascinating dichotomy in the way the media behaves. A um, couple of other stories that are out there. Uh, the Kelsey brothers, Travis and Jason, have got a podcast deal for $100 million from Amazon. This is one I was wrong on. I'll admit it. There's tape of me out there back in the day saying, hey, I don't understand why any athlete would be worrying about doing a podcast while they are still playing sports. Whatever you can make off of podcasting or radio or anything else is a fraction of the salary that you're going to make as a pro athlete at a high level. 
I was wrong. Jason Kelsey is going to make more money on his podcast than he did playing for the Philadelphia Eagles. Travis Kelsey may make more money. Adam, look up what Travis Kelsey's salary is. Travis Kelsey may make more money talking on a podcast than he does dominating at tight end in the NFL. I can't believe this is real. This is one I got wrong. Now, to a certain extent, this is directly connected to Taylor Swift, who is a billionaire. If Travis Kelsey never had dated Taylor Swift, what would the value of the Kelsey Brothers podcast be? $10 million? I don't think it's crazy to think that Taylor Swift has 10 times the value of the Kelsey Brother podcast. But I got to say, I've done well with OutKick in my media career, built myself to 100 millionaire. One thing that I think I got wrong, if I went back in time, I think when I left um, doing the uh, 3HL show, so this would have been like 2014-ish when I was doing local sports talk radio on 104.5 The Zone. For those of you who don't know that story, they offered me a $20 a day raise. Uh, I would have been better off going to take a part-time job at McDonald's than re-upping uh, with the radio show offer I had. I said, no, nah, I'm out. I'll focus more on OutKick. I'll do Fox Sports, all those things. Um, I said, uh, let's see, hold on. Travis Kelsey is going to make more money. Is that right? Travis Kelsey averaging $14.3 million, according to Adam. So Travis Kelsey is going to make more money doing a podcast than he does playing tight end for the Kansas City Chiefs. That is bonkers. Like, his brother was an offensive lineman, at least. That is absolutely bonkers. He can make more money every year based on this deal with Amazon. But I said I was wrong about that. I never believed that would happen. Second, a part of me thinks... If I had wanted to absolutely maximize the money that I could make in media, I was wrong to do radio. Uh, When I left 3HL, I should have just gone full speed ahead into a podcast exclusive program, and I may well have made more money in audio from that than doing daily radio without kick the coverage in the morning and now being on Clay and Buck, which is the biggest radio show out there. And I think it's a fallacy of the market. Let me explain why. I think that doing live radio is way harder than doing a podcast. Yet in many respects now, podcast hosts are making more money than live radio hosts. And for those of you who haven't done both, live radio is a challenge. Guests might not show up. Audio might get screwed up. There's breaking news. You don't know what a caller is going to say. There's a lot of moving parts. You got to hit the ad read at this time. You got to get out at this time. You got hard outs. Like people who have never hosted a live radio show, there are a whole ton of different moving parts associated with that. Um, Podcast is easy. First of all, I'm live 15 hours a week on Clay and Buck. Most podcast hosts don't do more than five or six hours a week, and it's taped. So you can do it at your convenience. You don't have to be sitting at a particular place at a point in time every day. And yet a lot of podcast hosts are making more money. I don't begrudge the audio space money. But again, I'm just saying from my career perspective, live radio is more challenging and for the most part doesn't pay as much as podcast, even though podcast is easier. And I'll sum this up by saying, I don't know anybody who's good at live radio that would be bad at a podcast. I think a lot of people who have successful podcasts could not show up and host a live radio show. So I think the radio talent is a higher level than the podcast talent. It's more hours. It's a more challenging job. Yet, in many respects, it actually pays less. I think that's a flaw of the marketplace. But my general thesis is that all audio is coming together. And ultimately, you're just moving towards an era where everything is on demand. And I don't know how long it's going to take, but you just ask for whatever the latest show is. And it doesn't matter whether it was distributed on radio or TV. And by the way, I'm drinking my Crockett coffee right now delectable. Um, You know, Buck and I own Crockett Coffee, crockettcoffee.com. I think 
owning your own business. That was the smart decision I made with OutKick. But I think owning your own business that advertises into your shows is the next iteration of where things are headed. And I'm going to own a bunch of businesses doing that. Uh, Finally, uh, I saw this from Brett McMurphy, and I said, oh, this is great. He has a list of, again, this is Brett McMurphy, friend of mine I used to work with at Fan House back in the day. Brett got laid off in 2011 like I did. That's how I ended up starting OutKick. Um, Since the college football playoff era in 2014, the most overrated teams based on preseason final polls. Okay? These are the 10 most overrated teams in a playoff era. This is a great idea. I imagine the amount of work that this took was substantial. This is Brett McMurphy's work. What do you think the most overrated team is in the playoff era? Auburn. Auburn, the Tigers, are the most overrated team in all of the college football playoff era, followed by Southern Cal, Wisconsin, Texas A&M, LSU, Texas, Oregon, Oklahoma, Miami, and Florida State. Over the last decade, the 10 most overrated teams, everybody likes to talk about who the most overrated teams are, Auburn, USC, Southern Cal, Wisconsin, A&M, LSU, Texas, Oregon, Oklahoma, Miami, and Florida State. How many of those teams would you have gotten right? I bet a lot of you would have bet Notre Dame is the most overrated And according to Brett McMurphy, those are the 10 teams that are the most overrated. Makes me wonder who's the most consistently underrated in the Power Five as well. Uh, But all of that, we will be discussing. My gambling picks are up. We'll have some fun Thursday with Kelly Stewart doing a week one college football breakdown. But I love all of you. DBAP, unless you need to SBAP, I am Clay Travis, and this... Well, this has been Outkick the Show.